Well, welcome to Beyond Belief. I'm George Norrie. One of our favorite guests, L.A. Marzulli with us, author, lecturer, filmmaker. He has penned 13 books, including the Nephilim Trilogy, which has made the CBA series of bestsellers. It's amazing. His new film series on the trail of the Nephilim already has five episodes. And I say already because you're constantly working on new <laughs> ones. You don't stop. Yeah, that's true. And we love it. I love what I do. Now, tell us about your work. How'd you get involved in the Nephilim and explain to people who aren't biblically inclined, just what are the Nephilim? This goes back to around circa 1988. And I had always had trouble with the biblical narrative. When you go to places like Noah's flood and you kind of go, why? Why does this God of the Old Testament destroy everybody on the planet? Yeah. You kind of scratch your Why head. Why does he mean? Yeah, that's, that's it. And then you go to Babel, the next thing, and it's like, wait a minute. Now he's confusing the language. Then you go to Sodom and Gomorrah, and he's with his fire and brimstone on these guys. It's everywhere. Right? Yeah, it's like, what's going on here? And then finally, in, when Joshua and the crew, the Israelites, come in to the promised land, they're killing everybody, burning the cities, killing. And you sit there <laughs> and you go, wait a minute, you know, this Jesus. God of the Old Testament, how do I reconcile these two? In fact, when I was a brand new Christian, this is circa, you know, 1980. So I had been vexed with this for about eight, nine years. And uh, I remember getting to the, 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 the conquest of Canaan and just going, I can't do this. Right. And just, you know, right. this is, I don't understand this. And I couldn't get anybody to explain it. So one day I was in a bookstore and I was looking, someone had asked me about life on other planets. And this is, this is the book that changed my life. Dr. I. D. E. Thomas. His book was called The Omega Conspiracy. Uh -huh. I took it home, I read it, and he had the answers. And he talked about, and he referenced books from the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Ethiopian Bible, Classics. which are not part of our canon. Not part of our canon, okay? So I was, I was blown away by this, and specifically in the Book of Enoch, because what, the, what Enoch does is it gives us a view into the antediluvian world that most people don't know about. And Enoch was hidden, really, from most people on the planet until R.H. Charles discovered it in the 19th century. What that does is it, it gives us this, this view of this incredible cosmic battle which has been raging in an unseen dimension. And what we see is these fallen angels, angels is just a word for messenger, sure. these angelic entities make an oath on Mount Hermon to do this deed. And what they do is they contaminate the seed. And I'll get into that because they take wives, they have children from the wives. These are earthlings, These earthling are wives. Earth, earthly women, but a, a basically a, an entity, interdimensional entity, which is immortal. So you, you get this combination which produces this hybrid entity known as the Nephilim. And this hails back in the Genesis 3.15 narrative, which states, the seed of the dragon will be at enmity at war with the seed of the woman. He, coming from the seed of the woman, will crush the dragon's head. That huh. sets up the rest of the biblical narrative. But if you don't know what that means, and if you don't have the proper translation of it or right. understand it, you don't get it. Then you, then you never, when you get to Noah's flood, the Tower of Babel, Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, the, the five kings, the whole deal, the, the conquest of Canaan, you're left going like I was. What's going on? Are here? the Nephilim evil? They're in a fixed state. They're, some people call them the soulless ones. Uh, the book of Enoch tells us that they sinned uh, against mankind. They were cannibalistic. They were sexually deviant. They were giants. They were giants. They would come in and drink. They would tear off the heads of people, allegedly, oh my and God. drink the blood. They were inc and like this taking is, a bottle cap off a beer. But, but Native American, Native American, First Nation people tell us exactly the same thing. Same Thousands thing. of years later, these red-haired, six-fingered giants would come in, rip the heads off to the braves, drink the blood, you know, mutilate the bodies. I mean, crazy stuff. And this is all in, in Native American oral tradition. I'm not making that, this stuff that is, up. You can't make this no, stuff up. No, you can't. In St. Louis, where I come from a lot. Cahokia. Right across the river in Cahokia, Cahokia Illinois, the Cahokia Mound. What the heck are these mounds? They're all over the planet. Yeah. Cahokia is about 450,000 uh, tons of earth. So what does that mean? If you, were to stay, if you were to deconstruct the mound and put all that dirt in dump trucks, all right, 
you get end-to-end -end dump trucks over 200 miles long. Wow. That gives us an idea of the amount of dirt. Full to the top. Full to the top. Yeah, in your film on the trail of the Nephilim, you take a look at what the mounds look like. You can only see that from above. That's amazing, isn't it? It is. Mind-blowing. Well, are they burial grounds, LA? No, they're not. They're, they're not. not. They're not burial grounds. Although they have been used uh, for, for Native Americans coming in and will use them for, for secondary interments. But the original, the, the original let's say, Cahokia, because you mentioned that, um, on top of Cahokia was a platform. And allegedly, on top of the platform, archaeologists believe there was a, a construction about um, 50 feet by 100 feet and allegedly 40 feet high. There was a stockade all right. around Cahokia, 10 feet high. Why do they need that? What, right. what, what are they doing? And in my opinion, Cahokia, Miamisburg, other sites that we've been to, these are gateways. These are portals. These are high places. And in fact, I could take you to a place in England on the Salisbury Plain. I could blindfold you and go, George, where are we? And you'd look at that man and go, wow, we're in Ohio, LA. That's right, we're but here. But we're not in Ohio, we're in England. They look the same. Yeah, so they came over. What happened to them? Well, this is, this is what's amazing. Um, this debate went on in the 19th century and it, it was very heated. And certain people were saying, you know, something else is going on here. There may be supernatural uh, things that we're looking at. It might be the lost tribes of Israel. Something's going on, but no one, no one really knew. This guy, Cyrus Thomas, around 1910, 1920, decreed Native Americans built the mounds, but they simply forgot that they had done so. Yeah. And this is taught in, in archaeological and they believe it? That people believe it. This is what you're taught, and you're regurgitated if you're going to pass. So people like me are looked at as pseudo-archaeologists, yet I'm on the field deconstructing the, the popular narrative and saying that, wait a minute, you got 10,000 mounds alone in Ohio. That's all these people did all day long. And Native Americans coming into Ohio, like the Shawnee now, people say that archaeologists saying the Shawnee built a serpent mound in Ohio. It's the largest snake effigy on the planet. Right. So the Shawnee chief, which we show in the film, states on the record, the Shawnee did not build the serpent mound. So who do we believe? Now we've got a clip, uh, LA, from one of your series, of course, about the official explanation for the mounds. And let's look at this theory. Okay. Cyrus Thomas is credited as creating the paradigm, which still exists today, that Native Americans built the mounds, but they had forgotten they had done so. However, are there artifacts that might point to a different narrative? Throughout the 18th and 19th centuries, reports of giant skeletons were printed in newspapers all across the country. As people dug into the mounds and unearthed the bones of what seemed like a lost race. Why has this been left out of the official narrative? Why are other artifacts like ax heads weighing over 30 pounds called ceremonial? What if they're not ceremonial but utilitarian. Why is it that Native Americans talk about a race of giants that inhabited the land before they did? They tell of six-fingered, red-haired giants who were often cannibalistic as well as sexually perverse. Is there a hidden history that has been deliberately obfuscated? As you just pointed out to us, I would have hated to have lived during that era. My gosh. Terrifying. Terrifying, Absolutely indeed. Terrifying. Where did they find the bones of these so-called giants? They were everywhere, basically, from, from the eastern United States all, all across, you know, from coast to coast, no pun intended, uh -huh. but that's, they're everywhere. In fact, we had a lead on, on something today, which we're trying to vet, allegedly of a nine-footer in situ uh, in an undisclosed location. Whether that's true or not, I don't know, but that came in this morning. Is this information, L.A., being suppressed? Absolutely. Why? Be, you know, when, we were, when I was out in Catalina, um, I got wind 
uh, that, that a cache of records had been discovered by Ralph Glidden. Glidden was a primitive archaeologist employed by the Hay Museum in the 1919-1921. He was out there in the Channel Islands, which go from Santa Barbara down to San Diego. And he was doing these primitive archaeological digs. He was digging up nine-footers and even talked about this. All that was suppressed. Well, this cache of records, when, when he was just basically left the planet for 50 years, and, and John Borgina discovered it in the, in the, uh, in the Wrigley Theater on the island of Catalina. It was front page news in the LA Times. Wow. I got wind of it. It took me six months to get the museum to allow me to come on the island and look at the look at the documents, pictures, whatever they, were they reluctant had. Reluctant, indeed. Very much right. so. Until I sent them a thousand dollar check ah, that for the new museum, and that opened the door. Exactly, that opened the door, and uh, I was there. And you know, I, I do spend some time in the archives. Not a lot, depending on what I'm doing. Most of the time, it's out in the field, talking to people actually on site. But archives are incredible because you never know what you're going to get. And I'm there in the archives in the museum on Catalina, and John Borgina brings out museum boxes, and in the museum boxes are manila folders with pictures in them, because I asked to see that first. Sure. Within 20 minutes, I had the picture which went viral. It's Ralph Glidden leaning on a shovel in an excavated grave, and in front of him is a skeleton in situ. And we, I knew it was big, but I didn't know how big. So right. I sent the, scout, sent the picture to three different guys, you know, techies, who looked at this thing, deconstructed it, digitized it, knew the height of Ralph Glidden at five foot eight, and basically all three of them, no collusion until after they gave me the data. Then I, we did a conference call mm -hmm. together, which was a real hoot. They all put it just around nine feet tall. A giant. A giant. A giant. A giant. And you can't talk about mounds without talking about serpent mounds. Yeah. The Serpent Mound is the largest snake effigy in the world. It sits on an outcropping of land that overlooks a waterway. The serpent undulates through the landscape, and this corresponds to solar alignments. Some say that the head points to the summer solstice. A two-story tower is erected on the site so visitors can see the serpent's body. However, even from this vantage point, it's still difficult to see the head of the serpent. It is only when one is high above the effigy does one begin to see the serpent's head, whose mouth is wide open in the act of swallowing an egg. Why go through the trouble of constructing this if the person viewing it can't really see what they are looking at unless they are high in the air above the effigy? Who is the prince of the power of the air? It reminds me of the Nazca lines in Peru. It's similar. Same kind of thing, right? Very, very similar. You can only really appreciate it I've been there three different times. There's a tower that goes up about two stories, and you can you get an idea of what you're looking at. But when I flew the drone up a couple hundred feet, and actually higher than that, all of a sudden the whole effigy comes into view. You have we have to understand that this thing is based the the serpent is based on an 18 and a half year lunar cycle. If the serpent's head is a gape, showing it in the act of attempting to swallow an egg. An egg. Okay, this goes right back in the Genesis 3.15 narrative, which states the seed of the woman will be at war. The seed of a dragon will be at war with the seed of the woman. The serpent, huh. there it is, trying to devour that egg. And you can only see it from the air. And it's thousands of years old. Why construct something like this? That you can't that see. That you can't see. Unless it's for something above. Yeah. So who is the prince of the power of the air? Absolutely. The dragon. You made something called Mathematical Mysteries of the Mound Builders. What is that? Well, we knew that there was advanced geometry, advanced surveying techniques, trigonometry. Um, but we didn't know to what depth, okay? And we, we brought in mathematicians, multidisciplinary, sure. you know, to try to get an idea. We, I hired a surveyor to go, let me give you the first one. The Nork Circle Mound, the Great Circle Mound, is about 1,200 feet across. There's a moat. That That's pretty good size, really right? Really good size. Yeah. And w that was my first... My first mound encounter, if I can talk about this for a second, someone told me about it. Russ Dizdar talked talk to me about it, yeah. told me about it. So I'm there at a conference. I asked my guide, well, can you, can, my driver, can you take me to the Great Circle Mound? He says, yes. So he drops me off in the parking lot. I walk up this, this little narrow asphalt path, and I get to the top, and I turn, and I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling it chills here, and I look at this thing, this huge circle with the entrance, and I just froze in my tracks. And I, was, I just sat there, just like vibrating, looking sure. at this, realizing that this, is, this has deep meaning for me. This is my future, although I didn't know it at the time. Right. But, I mean, I'm looking at the fingerprints of the supernatural. So we hired a, a surveyor 
to go in and measure the moat because there's no waterway around there. Is this the Great Circle Mound? This is the Great Circle Mound. There's a moat okay. all the way in the interior. All right, that's unusual. So it's basically, he told us, for all practical purposes, it's dead level. It's within six inches to a foot of being dead level. Well, let's look at this because this is, this is fascinating. The Great Circle Mound in Newark, Ohio is over 1,200 feet in diameter. It has an interior moat on the inside of which in ancient times was filled with water. How did the ancients create a level surface so that the water would fill the moat equally? Todd Willis is a surveyor and also a structural engineer. We hired Todd to survey the moat to see how level it was. We were astounded to discover that the moat for all practical purposes was dead level. How was this done thousands of years ago before the invention of surveying equipment like what Squire and Davis used? How were the builders able to construct the moat without the use of a transit? Does this moat inside the Great Circle Bound present a problem in that without some kind of surveying equipment, it would be almost impossible to keep the bottom of the moat level for hundreds of feet? Are we looking at the fingerprints of the supernatural hiding in plain sight? L.A., thanks for being <laughs> Thank on Thank you, George. Belief. Appreciate it. Well, you know what? He is obsessed, but it's great because he's getting answers for us that we don't get anyplace else on the trail of the Nephilim. I'm George Norrie, and thanks for watching Beyond Belief.